something beside me A light to the kerosene And the places aren't real anymore And the faces don't say anything In the silent light Of the mind blown devil's chess club i'm aaron good this episode of devil's chess club is available to everyone courtesy of four died trying the new documentary film series which explores the extraordinary lives and calamitous deaths of jfk malcolm x martin luther king and rfk you can purchase the four died trying prologue episode on apple tv and other streaming services like amazon the next chapter chapter one should be available any day now i'm told Please support us by subscribing to the American Exception podcast on Patreon. You'll get access to many episodes of the American Exception podcast, including the Peter Dale Scott oral history series with new episodes coming this month. I cannot do Peter's life and work justice here, so I want to summarize by saying that I don't think anyone has lived through and chronicled the arc of the U.S. empire like Peter. With deep politics and the death of JFK and the road to 9-11, He got the only critical books on, respectively, the JFK assassination and 9-11. These are essentially the only critical accounts of these events published by a major university press. And that doesn't even scratch the surface of his scholarship and life story. So I urge everyone to subscribe to the American Exception podcast on Patreon. Today I'm talking with Asa Wynn Stanley. He's an investigative journalist at Electronic Intifada. He also has a new Substack, which we'll link to in the show notes. He's also the author of a new book, Weaponizing Anti-Semitism, How the Israel Lobby Brought Down Jeremy Corbyn. Bryce Green and I are going to be talking with Asa about Gaza and the unfolding genocide there. Asa Wynn Stanley of Electronic Intifada, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Good to be with you. So you have written a, you wrote a story a, uh, a while back, I guess this was a, more than a week ago now uh, that it came out, but it builds on earlier reporting that uh, you all had done uh, about what happened on the night of October 7. And I personally think the weight of evidence, but also logic just points more and more in this direction. The headline of your article is uh, Israeli HQ ordered troops to shoot Israeli captives on 7 October. And uh, this is basically saying that the imperative for Israel on that night seems to have been to really avoid allowing Hamas to return with a whole lot of hostages because that would have been an unmitigated victory for them, for their objectives. And so... Israel seems to have killed a lot of people to stop that from happening uh, in order to basically make lemons out of lemonade or turn this whole uh, the debacle into an excuse for an onslaught uh, into a, or a, a siege of Gaza, really. Um, what, uh, what, what do you think is the significance of, of this? And I mean, why does it not get reported in the West very much in an honest way? Yeah, well, I mean, these are all good questions. I mean, I, I think it's, it's it's a really significant issue, right? Because this matters. And the reason it matters is that the genocide that's now being waged against the Palestinian people in Gaza by Israel and its uh, US and uh, European accomplices is being justified in mainly by the argument that the 7th of October was this unprecedented and uniquely evil massacre of Jews. That's the way it's phrased of, of Jewish people. Um, that's, you know, almost uh, in, in the realm of the Holocaust. But actually, if you look objectively at what we know, I mean, we still don't, there's still a lot. I think we don't know about what happened on, on the during the Palestinian assault that began on the 7th of October don't forget it carried on for the next few days 
and there's still a lot, that, a lot that I think we don't know. But if you looked objectively at it, and what I've concluded, and what my some my colleagues are beginning to conclude as well, is that it was a military assault by a, a guerrilla force, an incredibly successful military assault, uh, which overwhelmingly targeted military targets, and um, which was successful in overwhelming the Israeli military's uh, Gaza division of, of its, uh, you know, the main part of its southern division, the Gaza uh, division. It was completely overwhelmed and um, if not outgunned, then it was outsmarted and it was um, outfought on the day. Um, and what happened, because it, that military assault was so successful, what happened was the Israelis enacted... Uh, a military doctrine, a suicidal military doctrine, doctrine, which is called the Hannibal Directive. And this is, those of us who've been observing this closely, this is what we could see happening. And we said they're doing the Hannibal Directive because they've done it before. But now what I'm reporting on in this latest article of mine is that what we've been saying since the 7th of October has now been proven by Israeli sources, by um uh impeccable <laughs> you could you could say impeccable israeli sources in the sense that these are israeli national security journalists who are i mean i mean you know to be generous to them you could say they have sources within the israeli deep state they have sources within the israeli military and intelligence apparatus if you want to be less charitable to them um you could characterize them as um, stenographers for the mossad and the shin bet which I, I mean that's the way i would put it really um, uh, but you no, know, both ways are accurate. But um, the point is that what they've confirmed in this article and, and my article here that you've got on the screen is uh, uh, that you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Israeli HQ ordered troops to shoot Israeli captives on 7 October is based on a, this long article which appeared in the uh, Israeli media a few weeks ago. Um, and what the, the journalists, Ronan Bergman and Yorav Zitun, have confirmed is that this military doctrine, the Hannibal Directive, was ordered from the top at midday on the 7th of October. That they, they uh, from the Israeli war room in this underground bunker uh, deep below Tel Aviv, um, they ordered all units to uh, enact the Hannibal Directive in effect. Uh, that's that's the words of this article that they used, the, they used, they, um, gave them a go ahead to use the Hannibal Directive, which is um, essentially it's a doctrine which uh, the main priority is to stop um, Palestinian and other Arab resistance fighters, guerrilla fighters from taking Israeli captives alive. So the, the, the concept is that it's better that they be dead, essentially, the Israeli captives be killed rather than become... Um, uh, bargaining chips in a, any kind of prisoner exchange between the Palestinian fighters and Israel, because in the past, such prisoner exchange have led to um, many hundreds of Palestinian prisoners being released. Um, there was the famous prisoner exchange of um, uh, of more than a decade ago now of Gilad Shalit, the Israeli um, soldier who was captured in Gaza um, and he was kept in Gaza for many years, and then he was released in a prisoner exchange for 1,024 Palestinian prisoners. And so with the hundreds of Israeli captives that the Palestinian fighters took uh, prisoner on the 7th of October, um, based on that precedent, theoretically, it's enough for, you know, hundreds of thousands of Palestinian prisoners to be released. Um, uh, there isn't actually hundreds of thousands, there's thousands, but you know, theoretically, it could be enough to release all the Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails. And that is something that they wanted to, to stop happening. And so, I mean, you could see the, the photo on, on the screen, the people watching the video version of this. Um, this is from this is a photo taken in November in a car lot, um, a scrapyard, effectively, outside an Israeli settlement in um near the Gaza Strip called Netivot. And these were destroyed cars and vans. You can see these Toyota Hilux uh, white vans in the in the front there. Um, these, I, I mean, it, it, 
he, there's lots of other footage of these kind of vehicles in the aftermath of the, the 7th of October attack that bear all the hallmarks of being attacked by um, Hellfire missiles. Now, Hamas, I mean, look, Hamas is, 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 is fairly well armed. It's not as armed, well armed as um, Hezbollah, the Lebanese armed group, resistance group. Um, but it, it has, you know, it has a, a fair amount of weaponry, including um, a lot of domestically made arms. But it's got nothing like Hellfire missiles. You know, I mean, just I mean, look, you can see the evidence is there. You I mean you can see just on its surface, there's no way this was done by a a, a small guerrilla force. And there were there were reports um, about that pretty early on too, about people saying that yeah, helicopters were there and they were firing. And you saw the videos, and even random, even myself and everybody else that saw it on Twitter was like, isn't isn't Hamas usually just firing rockets into Israel that don't even kill people? Like they they are armed. And they have better arms than that, but there's like no way. It never made any sense that this would have been the result of, of, of Hamas. Yeah. So like the the rockets are, um, uh, you know, they're domestically made um, projectiles which are fired into uh, Israeli settlements in in so, well, well they they I mean they reach fairly far now. They can reach as far as Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, but these are not um, missiles with warheads. And they, for the most part, they don't, they cause damage. And they're really, um, they're really more of a psychological weapon, really, than anything else. Um, they don't cause, unless they, unless they hit someone in a direct hit on the head, they're not going to really cause deaths. Um, I mean, they, they have in the past occasionally, but for the most yeah. part. When happen. was the last time an Israeli civilian was killed by a, a, a Hamas rocket before October seventh? It was years and years, wasn't it? Um, I I think in twenty. I, I can't say exactly when the last time was, but I think there was one, or to put, there there was there was a very small number in in twenty twenty one when there was um, the uh, exchange of fire between the uh, Israelis and um, uh, Hamas. Then, um, right, but. But you know, so you know, I mean, look, these they they're armed, but not on this level. So this article that I've written is um, really the latest in a long series of revelations that we've had about this issue of the Hannibal Doctrine since the seventh of October. Um, the Hannibal Doctrine it goes uh, uh, just a bit of background on it. Really, it goes. It was established secretly in nineteen eighty six. Um, by uh, Israeli officers, by top Israeli officers. And um, it was in the context of the Israeli occupation of South Lebanon when uh, Hezbollah, the armed resistance group that um, eventually did drive out the Israelis from South Lebanon, almost all of South Lebanon, except for a, a small uh, parcel of land, which is now uh, remaining, still occupied the, the Shabbat farms. But um, for the most part, it, uh, Hezbollah eventually in, in the year 2000 managed to drive out the Israeli occupation forces along with some Lebanese collaborators and the South Lebanon army. Um, but in that context, you know, there was there was there was many years between the Israeli occupation that began in 1982. Well, it actually began before then, but um, there was the big invasion of 1982. But there, the point is that there was uh, there was several there, there was years of a low intensity warfare uh, in this guerrilla force against the Israelis. And part of that, there was a, uh, a, 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 a capturing operation where the Hezbollah managed to capture three Israeli soldiers. And due who, who um, uh, there was then later in release, in negotiations to release, I, I believe they were killed I'm not sure at what point. I, th I think probably as they were captured, it ended up they were, it turned out they were, you know, in the end, it turned out they'd been captured and killed. Um, I, I don't know exactly how it happened, whether it was in the process of the operation or whatever. But the, the point is, even for the dead bodies, they had to um, negotiate for their release. Um, and, you know, then that, that cost them eventually release of prisoners. And Palestinian fighters eventually did similar. Um, uh did something similar as i mentioned before um and because of that the israelis established this hannibal doctrine now um for people who know their ancient history 
Hannibal was, of course, you know, Hannibal, who, you know, was reputed to have um, ridden elephants across the Alps and all, all, all this kind of stuff. He was the Roman Empire's great enemy. He was a Carthaginian, uh, North African um, general. Um, and the, the only reason that he's relevant is that he uh, is reputed to have poisoned himself rather than be captured alive by the Romans. So it can't be a coincidence. I mean, there's look, there's been some when the Israeli press is kind of forced to talk about the Hannibal Directive because they don't like talking about it. But when they are sort of forced to, to talk about it, um, I've seen recently there was one kind of excuse where there, someone was saying, well, we don't really know why it was named the Hannibal Directive. And they're sort of hinting, well, it was just a random word. Chosen. <laughs> but it's not. I mean, look, the nature of it. And the name of it, the fact that Hannibal killed himself rather than be captured alive, that's clearly what it's aiming at. And the the stated directive states that um it, it that well I can read the, the original. I've got uh I've got um my article in front of me here. So the original wording of the directives included the phrase that um it ordered Israeli forces to quote halt the capturing force at any price and that quote in the course of a capture the main task becomes rescuing our soldiers from the captures even at the price of hitting or injuring our soldiers I mean the way that they say even at the cost that's all that's a it's the deception in the way that they word it is actually reveals more than it hides I think because you just start doing the math you're realizing that they're not even they're even obscuring what they're saying now in the way that they explain the directive i mean it's basically not like at the risk of killing them it's kill them it, they don't say it but the obvious implication is it's better to have them be dead than be hostages yeah right exactly this is it and it's um you know the whole thing the, the concept of rescuing them by shooting at them is a really interesting one um <laughs> it's i mean it reminds me of you know the american uh, army uh, officer who was reported um after the tet offensive in vietnam to have uh said that we destroyed the town in order to save it, it it's kind of you know rescuing in that way um it's not actually rescuing the life of the soldier but it's it's rescuing their physical presence from the opposition fighters. Um, it, it's that kind of strange justification. So, you know, eventually this secret doctrine was exposed. It, it was enacted in 2014, during the 2014 Israeli war on the Gaza Strip. Um, in, um, I believe it was in the Shujaia neighborhood uh, uh, of Gaza City, Eastern Gaza City, where there was an Israeli soldier who um, was captured by um, Hamas fighters. And um, the response of the Israelis was, it was later reported that they, the order went out over the radio, Hannibal, Hannibal, and they they artillery shelled the whole area so they ended up killing this soldier along with the um, hamas captors but um you know the the remains of the soldier were um then kept uh by the hamas fighters and that this the remains were then later negotiated over ultimately they didn't release anyone i don't think to, to secure those remains um but because of this incident it was it was reasonably high profile um it actually surfaced this doctrine this directive and we at the time i mean this is a decade ago now like at the electronic intifada we did some reporting on it at the time um max blumenthal wrote about it as well in his book um about that war the um the 51 day was great book max actually actually went to gaza in the aftermath of that war and um he did some reporting on the Hannibal Directive then. And so because we were, f and you know, actually um, only a, a few, two years later, there was an, a, there was, um, I, I, there was a sort of Hannibal near miss in the West Bank. It's not very well known about, but I was looking through our archives about this and there was, um, the Hannibal Directive was, that there was a soldier 
in the West Bank in the Kalandia refugee camp, who I believe was briefly captured or w went missing. It, 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 the circumstances are a little bit unclear. The guy didn't end up being killed, but it was a kind of Hannibal near miss. So it has been ordered in the West Bank as well. Um, and so because we're familiar with this, that this exists, this, you know, it, it, it's it, it's, a, it's a kind of bizarre aspect of um, uh, Israeli. I mean, we have to say Israeli culture, I think, because it is there's there's a kind of deeper thing there, which we could talk about, which is the kind of suicidal tendency within a Zionism and then within the Israeli state in particular. Um, uh, but uh, there's that. But, you know, because we knew this has existed, as we were following what was happening on 7th of October uh, and the, the the week after, you could see these videos, these Israeli military is releasing these um, sort of grainy uh, green videos of um, uh, helicopter gunship turret footage, essentially, showing that they were shooting, basically shooting at everything in the area, you know. They were just releasing these videos and they were saying, oh, these are Hamas terrorists we've killed. But you look at the videos and it's a civilian car. How do they know who's in that car? You know, even if it was Hamas, quote unquote, terrorists, well, you know, didn't the so-called Hamas terrorists just capture all these Israeli civilians? So you're killing everybody in that car. You can't identify them. You're shelling them with hellfire missiles from helicopters and drones and then you're filming them afterwards with you know completely destroyed completely gutted and then there was one particularly graphic video that they posted to the israeli foreign ministry's twitter account which actually showed a um a charred uh practically a skeleton um and it was it was almost reminiscent of the the highway of death during the first gulf war you know when the um american military you know, infamously slaughtered all these um, Iraqi um, civilians and soldiers who were, were fleeing, I believe it was Baghdad. And these really, you know, graphic images of, of people um, burnt alive by um, uh, artillery shelling, hellfire missiles, whatever it was in, in, in Iraq. I'm not as familiar with the details, but clearly these corpses, you know, and of course in their propaganda videos, they were saying, oh, you know, the evil Hamas ISIS terrorists were burning up civilians alive well beyond recognition <laughs> yeah uh, well you know i mean if you looked at that video it looked to me like yeah okay maybe one of them was when one or two of them were probably palestinian fighters but there was also people in the back seat so they were probably captives you know they were almost certainly captives um and they but they you could tell they were indiscriminately there was a chaotic response there was a chaotic response you could tell they were basically just shelling and 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 uh destroying everything in the area indiscriminately because that's what the israelis do right they do it um in gaza they do it in the west bank they just sh they shell and they destroy indiscriminately um civilians uh and combatants alike but what was new about this was for the for really the first time almost i think I mean, really, the first time since 1948, the 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 Nakba 1948, they were doing the kind of destruction they normally do in Gaza, but in within the 1948 territories, within so-called southern Israel, right? So they were they were um, indiscriminately bombing everything, and that meant that they were at killing Israelis as well. And we could see that we could see the evidence of it straight away. If, you know, you had to read between the lines of the propaganda they were putting out, but the video evidence was was there from the beginning. But what's significant about this long article that was published in um, by Ronan Bergman and Yerav Zetun that um, I've based this report on, um, and we did a full translation of it from Hebrew, and I've actually appended it to the end of this article. So you can read it in full. It's a, it's a long article. I think I think it's about eight thousand words, something like that. Um, and um, it gives it this um, hour by hour breakdown from the Israeli military and intelligence services point of view of the day from when it started at, at 6.26 a.m. up until um, 1 p.m. Uh, on, uh, on, on, the, on uh, October 7th. And it really gives this breakdown. And, and 
it, it confirms what we've been saying, really. I mean, it's the most the two most significant revelations in it. I mean, there's a lot. This is a really significant piece, but there's lots of um, significant stuff in it. But really, the two most significant things are that they confirmed that Hannibal Directive was not only enacted. I mean, I, I mean, we could see that it was being enacted, reactivated. Um, and also that it had been clearly been expanded to civilians. Like it wasn't just soldiers that the Israeli soldiers they were attacking. It was Israeli civilians. Well, this was the first time that the Hannibal Directive had been used against civilians, right? Uh, I mean, it was usually described to as far uh, as we know. Soldiers. Yeah, as far as we know, that that does that does seem to be the case. Um, I mean, like I said at the beginning, it was it was it was secretive, so we we can't know for sure. But it does it does it's the first known instance of it. So, the, but this article confirmed that not only was that happening, but it was ordered from the top. So it 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 came from the top of the Israeli um, high command. So, so I, I think this is this is also interesting on a number of levels because uh, you mentioned Ronan Bergman as one of the authors for this article. Well, yeah. Bergman is also a uh, staff at the New York Times. Right. Um, what, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, he, he this article was published in Hebrew and a lot of this stuff coming out about the uh, Israeli attacks on its own civilians and about foreknowledge and a lot about the, you know, the other aspects of October 7th is being published in Hebrew, uh, but not in English. Um, and it seems that one of the only times there is any discussion of this article or these these aspects of October 7 is when people are trying to attack it and people are trying to say that this is just, uh, you know, conspiracy theories. It's not serious. And, uh, you know, these guys are a bunch of lunatics. Uh, and that's been essential in maintaining this idea that, uh, you know, uh, October 7th was just a bunch of lunatic Hamas terrorists trying to kill every Jew they could see. Uh, and even when they, the Israelis lowered the death count uh, of Israeli civilians by 200, mm. uh, which seemed to pretty much indicate that they had no idea who they were killing and that the bodies exactly. were so destroyed that uh, it would take uh, extensive forensic analysis to figure it out. Even when that happened, uh, you didn't hear any response. But only when uh, you know outlets like Electronic Intifada, Mondo Weiss, and uh, the Gray Zone uh, started getting more traction in covering these stories, uh, did the, you know, the Washington Post uh, send <laughs> someone out to start, you know, talking about it and uh, talk a little bit about that, that phenomenon of the Israeli press having more uh, information about reality than the United States press, e even though you would think it'd be the opposite, that somewhere in Israel, you would have more uh, a tighter information control, but the tighter yeah. information control is in the U.S., yeah, I mean, I think this is a, a really uh, fascinating aspect of this. Um, yeah, let's talk about that. But just to finish one point, which is that the two most significant things I think in this article are that that it's confirmed that the Hannibal Directive it wasn't just randomly used by maybe one or two soldiers here, sort of took you know in the chaotic situation took it upon themselves to do the Hannibal Directive. I think that did happen. I think it was a chaotic situation. And I do think that the fighters did start doing it spontaneously because they've been not totally spontaneously because they've been trained to do it for decades. Um, but um, I think that did happen. But also it's very definitive in this article at midday on the 7th of October, the um, Israeli Supreme Command position, the war room underneath the. Um, the you know israeli high command in tel aviv which is actually in a civilian area i've, I've been to it um and it's uh, it's in this article they call it the pit apparently it's called the pit by everyone uh, involved and this this article is is from their perspective right it's from the point of view of the people in the pit these high you know they're not they're not named but you know Roland bergman has has these sources there's no doubt about that these are shin bet people these are mossad people these are people in the high you know the, the supreme command of the israeli military um so there's that it confirmed that they issued orders to all units to quote all units that they should start using the hannibal directive at midday and that it, it, the reason they said it was midday in this article was because at midday was was when the video started emerging of uh, from Hamas uh, and other Palestinian resistance channels on Telegram 
um, of the captives, of the Israeli captives that had been taken to Gaza. So they wanted to, because it was still a, they hadn't retaken the South. The Israelis hadn't retaken the South. It was a chaotic situation. They were still fighting ongoing battles. The the the, the, the Palestinians had, their within 20 minutes, within about 25 minutes, they had overwhelmed the Gaza Division's local headquarters in Ra'im, in, in, this, in the Israeli settlement of Ra'im in the South. It only taken about 25 minutes to overwhelm it, to, to fight it, to um, destroy it, really. To re they captured and killed everybody in the military headquarters. And so they were fighting these pitched battles. Um, and the, the Palestinian fighters, they also successfully targeted the communications infrastructure. So there was no command and control. So even when they got fighter jets over and drones over, they didn't know what to hit. So they just started shooting everything and killing people. But when they saw these videos of the captives, they ordered from the top the Hannibal Directive at midday. So that is that's definitive now. That's that's at, there's no question about that. They ordered. And we it. don't know, but do we know who? It still is unknown whether it was the prime minister himself who authorized this or if it was. We don't know who. That, that's a person. good point. We don't know who exactly. Um, uh, it, but it, it's it's um, it, the the terminology they use in the article is that um the idf ordered it which means that you know the israeli military high command that's the that's the whole perspective of the article so you're right there's no um definitive uh, pointing out of, of which officer it would have been a very senior officer who ordered this this is the it, point so yeah, there's it that it would have been do, do you Go think on. that it has anything to do with i mean it, i i would guess the israel the israeli media is not so categorically different from the united states in its relationship to the intelligence agencies and everything else yeah and the and the establishment right. in general to me and the fact that this was also written by a guy who writes for the new york times also suggests this is no maverick outfit of no. uh, you know independent people so do you think that perhaps the reason that this does get reported is almost as a contingency plan like for, if things go south they can kind of pin this on Netanyahu and say, oh, this was a horrible, horrible tragedy. We've got yeah. to get rid of Netanyahu. I mean, might that be why they are actually reporting on it a little bit? Yes. And then you can get the U.S. to ignore that it ever happened anyway, so it doesn't even enter the discourse. I mean, it's quite, yes. a, it's quite a strange thing. This is, this is exactly it. I think that's exactly right. It's about internal competition within the Israeli political scene, the Israeli deep state, if you will, the you know the high the military intelligence apparatus and and the political actors which are often have a high degree of crossover you know for example Benny Gantz for example Benny Gantz for example who's um, a current opposition leader and who's in the war cabinet um, you know he he he's a former um, Israeli senior general and um, he actually campaigned to get his seat in the Knesset uh, boasting that he had in a previous war, it sent Gaza back to the Stone Age. That was the word he used, back to the Stone Age. Um, the other most significant revelation in the article is that we saw these hundreds of cars destroyed uh, 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 by apparently by Hellfire missiles. And uh, Bergman and Zaytun conclude, say, report in the article that the Israeli military's internal estimate is that 70 of these vehicles were, they're confirming 70 of these vehicles were they say vehicles not cars so that includes these bands were destroyed by israeli he helicopters apache helicopters drones or tank fire so they're confirming what we've been saying all along in a way um so right to to, to get to your last point aaron and, and to to, er to uh, bryce's question about the nature of the israeli media and um why are these um you know these journalists, these company men, why are they revealing this stuff which would not be revealed um, in the New York Times? Um, it, yeah, this is a really good question. And it, 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 so the first thing to say about the Israeli media is that it is not free. It, it, it has military censorship, like it has actual military censorship. Um, so it's much, much less free than the American media in that way. Um, uh, unless the American media is sending their uh, reports to their, uh, you know, their Israel bureaus and having them undergo military censorship, like right? CNN was just caught doing, and uh, others as well. Right. I mean, this this is a really good point that um, 
yeah, they do s submit to they sort of voluntarily these uh, you know mainstream media organizations in in America, they sub they end up submitting their journalism through um, the Israeli military censor in a way that the the U.S. First Amendment wouldn't. Uh, you know, they're sort of voluntarily giving up their First Amendment protections in that way. So there's that. You know, the, the Israeli military censorship is um, is 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 very extreme in that way. But the, if you read, I mean, it's it's fascinating if you read the full article, which I've, as I said, I've appended to my article because it's from their point of view. It, the whole thing is from the point of view of the Israeli military, the Israeli intelligence services. I mean, I was just listening to a podcast by my colleague um, John Elmer. Um, my colleague at the Electronic Intifada, John Elmer, and, and he he's got a really good analysis of the article where he was he his point, and I agree, is that you can tell his main sources were people in the Shin Bet, the Israeli internal security set, which is the, basically the kind of an equivalent of the FBI in a way, um, and, and probably also Mossad, which is their or kind of their CIA, um, because the, the Shin Bet comes across from their point of view as the heroes, right? Because there's these stories about how they ran the, 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 the Shin Bet's um, director. Um, I forget his name now. He's another Ronan, Ronan something. Um, he um, ordered anyone who's carrying a weapon to go down south and to take part in the battles. And another thing they reveal in the article is that there was 10 Shin Bet officers who took part in these battles and three of them were killed. And if you look up the names, uh, no, wait, no, no, sorry. It, there was dozens who took part and there was 10 killed. If you look up the names of, of people, if you, if you go into the Haaretz database of the dead, the 7th of October dead, you could find three um, supposed civilians who are actually Shin, Shin Bet officers, which is quite fascinating. Um, but so so why are they writing this stuff? So I, I mean, it's 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 what you said, Aaron. In, in a way, it's kind of a limited hangout, right? Because this stuff is coming out anyway. But also, it's it's just simply that their whole perspective, and they say it quite openly, is you know they, they their whole perspective and their whole reason for doing all this is they want to improve the Israeli military's response in any future wars, and they they want to. Um, they're kind of criticizing to do so they can do better, right? So they can basically, so they can kill Palestinians better. Some, some constructive criticism. <laughs> yeah, it's constructive criticism for for uh, Israeli settler colonialism, really, in that way. In, in a way that, you know, you do see uh, American, uh, some American journalists who will, you know, criticize the Iraq war that it was, a, you know, it was, um, it was a mistake. mistake. Yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah. No, there's there are guys who like uh David Corn, for example. I always thought him of him as like a, a likely, you know, when you when you look at who fits the profile of who would be CIA assets in the media, he's the most obvious one, or one of them. And he he wrote a book all about a, a Bush and how the Iraq War was criminal and like there's it's a it becomes a liberal thing to really denounce certain aspects of U.S. imperialism, but to ignore the more totally indefensible and radioactive things that you can talk about. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And it's it's the same thing with these two guys, I think. I think they um Ronan Bergman in particular does very much seem to be um a a, a, a really a stenographer for the Shin Bear and the Mossad. I mean, he wrote this um book, you know, this massive uh Rise and Kill I mean, First. Yes, he wrote Rise and Kill First. I mean, it's probably on New York Times bestseller list, I imagine. As you said, he's a staff writer for the New York Times magazine. Um, so he's writing, he's just, you know, he's written this story confirming that, um, you know, confirming that the Hannibal Directive is the Israeli military. The Israeli military's top brass is ordering all units that it has, um, it has now the directive to target Israeli civil, Israeli uh, not just soldiers, but Israeli civilians, in order to "quote unquote" rescue them by shooting them, um, shooting them with anything, uh, all units in in the military, which means drone fighter pilots, uh, drone fighter drone operators, um, uh, helicopter gunship pilots, tank operators, and and so forth. Um, 
that is a recipe for mass destruction and killing. And that's what happened. You know, that's why the, the, there's the, there was these hundreds of Israeli civilians killed. You know, uh, I'm not saying it's impossible that Hamas didn't kill any civilians, but it, it is starting to look like a large number of these civilians. Possi and we don't know yet. Possibly most were killed by the Israelis. So Bergman has written this stuff he's written this in this long article which has been published by one of israel's most biggest mainstream newspapers yediot Ahronot. it's in the weekend supplement of um yediot Ahronot, this mainstream newspaper mass circulation newspaper mainstream newspaper um based on impeccable insider sources saying israel killed israelis on the 7th of october and yet not a word of it in the new york times you know, there's not. He is this regular writer for the New York Times. You know, I'm I'm looking at his page, his author page. He published the the, the story about uh, about Israel having the uh, the plans for the Hamas attack a year before October seventh. So there are some things that he gets from uh, you know his spooky sources that he'll publish in English. Uh, but uh, apparently, this was too radioactive, and we're gonna keep it uh, you know linguistically inaccessible to Americans. And and why and Yediot chose not to translate this article. You know, we had we we got one of our um, translators to do it, who did a really good, quick job, really thorough job over uh, over the weekend. She worked all weekend to work on this really long article because it was so important to expose this. And we you know we had a feeling they probably wouldn't translate it. And Bergman's not reporting on it in the New York Times. It's left to us to translate it. And you can see because the audience for the article is Israelis, is other Israelis, is other Israeli elites really and this like speaks to your point aaron of of, of why why are they doing this is it to um the, there is a narrative in the israeli hard right that um the israeli uh elements of the israeli security services are out to get netanyahu and i think that's right i think that's actually correct well, they probably should be in the sense that he is not representing the national interests of israel in that best i can tell he is leading them towards destruction i don't that that's where there's a sense about people who talk about realpolitik and so on like okay you look at you're a total realist you're a cold hard realist if you in order to stop any or deal with any existential threat if you have to kill however many people that you have to do it because that's just the real world and if you don't you'll be dead right i mean that's real politique but zionism has turned into something crazier when they start talking about judea and samaria and they're wrecking references to like the old testament this isn't real politique this is insanity and i think that that insanity has taken over the top of the israeli deep state or establishment whatever we want to call it in the mindset and that it's also it, it's reflected in the fact that you see like 95 percent of israelis are in favor of or think that you know upwards of 90 percent think that they're using about the right level of violence in, in gaza to deal with this i mean this and so somebody like uh Bergman is that the guy's name? Uh, yeah, that wrote right the, Bergman, yeah. yeah. S somebody like this guy and, and the people that he speaks to in the intelligence. I mean, intelligence people are supposed to be above all cold hard realists. There have to be some people thinking that actually what we're doing here is potentially catastrophic. And if we at least have a way to like put blame this on Netanyahu, maybe there's a way to salvage this if it does go south and the U.S. doesn't go want a, a wider war and we're left here having really failed spectacularly. They can at least get rid of Netanyahu and and exercise this in their own mind. But I think that they're really talking about something that's since with the Rabin assassination uh, is a is a real change in, in the, uh, the the Zionist pinnacle of power. I mean, it, it's become totally insane in those dec in these last few decades, I think. And maybe some people are just recognizing this and trying to think of a way you might actually diffuse it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. I mean, it, it, when you see the uh, agenda at play with this kind of journalism, it's um, it's interesting because it, it does speak to these internal Israeli dynamics. So I, I think it is what you described. It is um, that they, especially the spooks, I, I think would like to kind of, but also some elements of the military officers would like to kind of 
but pin it on Netanyahu, but both sides are blaming each other, right? Because there's going to be a so massive... Netanyahu when claimed, he claimed that uh, like the October 7th incident uh, was the fault of people deliberately withholding in information from him, didn't he? Uh, he, he later walked that back, but right. yeah, the fact that these internal struggles are spilling out into the open, uh, I think it says a lot about, well, <laughs> the stability of the Israeli government, uh, to say nothing of the last three years and three elections. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, don't forget there was a big, you know, before this war, before this genocide started on the 7th of October, there was, you know, this big protest movement within inside Israeli society where the, you know, the uh, the liberal Zionist side were trying to depose Netanyahu because of his judicial reforms. Um, and there was elements of uh, the Israeli deep state who were opposed to, and presumably still are opposed to what Netanyahu was doing, um, you know, because they see it as, you know, what you said, like a, this, a, a less, he's not, basically he's not a good manager of 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 the settler colony as they see it like he's not doing a good job and he's potentially leading us towards a bad place um and you know we saw things like uh the even the Mossad announcing that it had allowed some of its officers to go to these demonstrations against Netanyahu in quite a public way in a in a political way um a, a, in December as well there was this Israeli air force colonel uh, whose name is Nof Erez um, I mean, he, he, he's a reservist, um, but he was actually, it seems that he was probably there, it, possibly in the pit, but he was certainly seeing, uh, you know, live updates of what was happening because uh, on the 7th of October, because they'd called in, they called in all their reservists, you know, um, and what he said in a, in a Hebrew podcast um, in, um, I believe it was in November, I reported on it in December. Um, and he described what happened as a quote unquote mass Hannibal. And he was kind of he was kind of making these excuses saying, well, you know, it's ambiguous. There's no there's no specific order to, to kill people, <laughs> only to shoot at them. Um, but uh, but he was saying, you know, it was a mass Hannibal. He's, he was kind of pressed by the journalist. This is all in Hebrew. Again, we had to translate it. Um, and um, he, he said, yeah, at a certain stage, Hannibal was applied. And that it was a mass Hannibal. And this is, again, this is a guy who's from more the liberal Zionist end politically. So, you know, and he is someone who had, he's, he's, an, he's a colonel, um, reservist colonel in the Air Force. Um, and he um, was somebody who had spoken out in the past against Netanyahu's ref, um, judicial reforms. And so, it, yeah, it's, it's like he was almost trying to he's trying to blame the netanyahu side for the security failures because there's this narrative about well netanyahu is obsessed by the west bank and he was putting soldiers into the west bank whereas they they should have been guarding the south etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah both sides are trying to trying to blame each other but it is fascinating i mean i find it fascinating that um just the like that bergman this massive story and there's not a word of it in the New York Times at all, you know. And he's um, he's 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 reporting. I mean, I'm I'm looking at his page on the New York Times, and he's he's reporting a lot. He's, you know, he's he's got co bylines regularly, and there's nothing about these massive revelations. But we did see something in the Washington Post, which doesn't talk about right. the revelations, but uh, talks about. Um... People talking about them. <laughs> yeah, it talks about your article. Uh, I mean, the electronic intifada as well. And Bryce, I know you're working on an article about this, and we'll discuss it more deeply. But this, to me, is, is an amazing piece in the Washington Post because it, it is. I am someone who's written about controversial issues of uh, the clandestine state and so on, like a uh, you know U.S. support for j radical uh, jihadis and so on. Uh, and the Kennedy assassinations and these sort of and the involvement in the drug traffic of uh, intelligence agencies and all this. So I'm really kind of steeped in this like propaganda that they use to dismiss quote unquote conspiracy theories. But here, growing October 7 truther groups say Hamas massacre was a false flag. Well, for, why even put that in scare quotes when who's calling them? Is anybody calling themselves that? Is there any reason to put <laughs> no. that? You're you're using the word in the first place, and then you're putting it in scare quotes, even to make it 
it's just it, it's obviously agenda driven here. Um, oh, there's a Holocaust denial, growing movement with ties to Holocaust denial. Well, first of all, a movement suggests that there's some sort of coherence to this, which is, yeah, is the not best they really... had. <laughs> the, the best she had was, uh, you know, this telegram group, Uncensored Truth, which, uh, you know, we looked at it and they say it has about 3000 subscribers, but we looked at it, it only has about 175 now, uh, <laughs> Now, I don't know if there was like some exodus or maybe there's a different one called Uncensored Truth. But <laughs> I, I mean, even if it is 3,000, even if it was 6,000, uh, I mean, that's that's extremely marginal. And these uh, days you don't even she, know you don't even know what is bots and what isn't with something like yeah. this. So and, yeah. and then you also had the, she also went and cited a post from r slash late stage capitalism <laughs> as an <Right> example <laughs> of, of this online community. Uh, who are bordering on Holocaust denial. It, it, it's so weird. Like, she cited all these random people, like a random woman at a protest who said that Israel murdered their own civilians. Uh, well, I mean, this is true. Uh, but yeah. Dwoskin <laughs> and the Post don't seem to uh, engage with it. They just try and discredit her by quoting someone random in the audience who allegedly said that anti-Semitism isn't real. I mean, it, it's it's very bad reporting in general like this is journalistic malpractice she should be she should like that's stop not that it. that's the problem it's not malpractice it is actually the practice of <laughs> conventional <laughs> journalism it, it is a exercise is in, in political manipulation and they get into they go right at your i mean in, in the most kind of weak and pitiful way they go after electronic intifada saying an article from november argues that quote most israeli casualties first why do you put most if you're only going to quote them for what that part of it, why put that word in quotation marks? Again, very weird. Um, perpetrated by the Israeli army. Say most. But, right. I mean, uh, they literally wrote most. Yeah. But why? I mean, yeah. this is just very I mean, strange. He's, he's misquoted me there. I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, she does. Number one, she doesn't link to the article so people could check it for themselves. But number two, she doesn't even name the article. You know, she so. But if people did. Uh, the article is called The Evidence, I, I wrote it, The Evidence Killed, The Evidence Israel Killed Its Own Citizens on 7 October and it was published on 23rd of November so it was really, it's a long article, it's basically an overview of all the evidence we had up to that point or most of the evidence, all the evidence that we could gather um, at all the most significant evidence let's say we could gather at that point that there was this you know, whatever you want to call it, friendly fire Hannibal Directive indications and it was very cautious and it was very deliberate and um and she's actually misquoting me there what i what i i didn't say that i did not say that definitively most israeli casualties on october 7th were perpetrated by um the israelis what this is the actual quote um i said so it, um it's about it, the lead of it is about an is a retired israeli army major who talked about some of this and said that some of it happened on a YouTube video. And I'll describe that as a kind of confession. So the quote is, quote, the confession discovered by the electronic intifada is one of the highest level confirmations to date that Israel killed many, if not most, of the civilians that died during the Palestinian offensive. So the point of that is we don't know. We, that certainly many, possibly most, but we don't know. Yeah, so... Uh, also, even so by saying Israeli casualties, quote. even by saying Israeli casualties, but you were commenting that comment refers to the civilians, right? If exactly. I heard that correctly. Yeah. So exactly. it's it's misleading yeah. in both ways. You don't say most, you say possibly most, but then you're not even really saying Israeli casualties, you're saying Israeli civilians. Exactly. You know, there's no question that uh, Hamas says that it targeted Israeli soldiers. Absolutely. You know, it killed them and it captured them. Um, it also captured some Israeli civilians, although most of them are, were now released in the prisoner exchange that took place on um, the in November. Um, but Hamas maintains that it did not target civilians. Um, it does concede that there may have been some civilians inadvertently killed in crossfire. But regardless of what people think of that, um, there is absolutely no doubt that Israeli Israel at this stage, there's no doubt that Israel killed Israelis on, on the seventh of October, and it's you know confirmed now by 
by these sources inside there. And and you know, she she didn't engage with that at all. You know, she did not engage with that. She kind of ignored it. She kind of made it in that article. I mean, uh, Bryce, your breakdown of her article was really good because you kind of deconstructed it in a in a really effective way. And she she didn't engage with the evidence. She she kind of mentioned it in passing and said, "Well, it was just one incident of friendly fire." No, that's that you know, it wasn't just the incident with um, Yasmin Parat. As we know now, I mean, to be fair, this um, I believe this um, Ronan Bergman piece hadn't come out yet when she wrote this article but even before then there was every indication that, that it wasn't just one incident of friendly fire it was happening all over the place um and and we could see that just from the videos and photos um within the kibbutzes all over the place um and now now confirmed really from high level israeli sources Right. And the person who describes himself as a former Israeli general in this aspect, why would they, was this person, this person was a major general, right? That's the one you're, they're talking about. Right, so she, she's just getting basic facts wrong. She's, she says he was a general. He's not a general. He was a, a major. And I didn't say he was a general. I said he was a major because that's what he was. <laughs> um, and this is this is a real, you know, she and again, you're right. Like She's not engaging with that. She, there's no attempt to say, well, is this true? Like he, he's claiming is he and and I looked into it and there's absolutely no doubt about it. Like he's uh, th so this guy's name. Hey, it looks like you were being a, a little too a little too generous with her. Uh, I looked I just look at the dates and that uh, oh, that Bergman piece had come out days before this okay, post piece came right. out. So okay. this is even it's even worse it's even worse than we thought. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, yes, you're right. Actually, oh, yeah, I see that now. Okay, yeah. So you know, just more evidence, really, of what I was saying. So yeah, I mean, this this guy that I led the that older, slightly older piece on from November on this uh, former Israeli, really interesting character. I mean, he was really. I mean. It, the article wasn't just about him. It, it it was really about it was really this collection of all the evidence up to that point, and that was the the kind of the hook into the article. Um, and his name, I mean, it seems to be a pseudonym, but he goes by um, the name uh, Graham Ip or Graham I. He has a, a sort of it's seemingly self published or an, at least an obscure publisher. He's got a, 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 he's written a a memoir of his time in the Israeli uh, military. Um, and, you know, you can download it from Amazon. So, yeah, it seems to be pretty much self-published. But, you know, there's no doubt, you know, there's photos of him um, in the Israeli uh, military. He was in the, the Golani Brigade, which is supposed to be this is elite Israeli um, infantry unit. He reached the rank of major. And he spent the best part of three decades, almost three decades in the is Israeli uh, military and he is an interesting character because he was um uh, interesting in a bad way he, he's he's, he's a, a south african um mm. who moved um and i read some of his book and he, he moved from um he moved around you know he, he was born in south africa uh i think he had a bit of a troubled youth he briefly moved to australia um but then he he went around about age 18 i think to um by himself to to israel and he joined the israeli army um and uh but the the really strange thing about it was that he spent three decades in the israeli army and it, it, it was in these youtube videos and this really strange um uh, obscure youtube channel called legacy conversations which is i mean i kind of recommend watching it to be honest because it's it's bizarre and fascinating but it's um interviews with veterans of South Africa's apartheid regime. They're mostly police uh, and army veterans. Uh, and they're sort of all reminiscing about how great it was, basically. And there, there's, there's like, I mean, it's strange. It's a strange one. And they have, um, there's, a, there's a bit of a religious bent to it as well, because they have this thing called Chaplain's Corner, where they have all these, um, uh, you know, former army chaplains talking about their faith and stuff so it's strange in that way but a lot of them talk about um almost in passing in a lot of ways how in the 70s and 80s 
as part of the apartheid regime they went to israel and they were trained in israel by the because there was these links between apartheid south africa uh, and apartheid israel and they talk about that um but then you've got people like this character who actually served in the israeli army as well and um you know you see you do see um some white south africans um now there is there's, there has been reporting in recent years of white south africans actually converting to judaism so that they can go and become settlers even in the west bank because you know they they miss the they miss the uh, south africa being an apartheid regime and so they is that what happened to all the the worst thugs from rhodesia and south africa they had to they had to become ID, they had to convert to, to their to judaism because their real religion is just killing people who aren't white i mean i don't understand what that's just yeah. bizarre it's starting to seem that way that yeah some of their real religion might be white supremacy but yeah i mean but but anyway so what i mean what he, he so when um 7th of october began they started to do these sit reps with this guy um major graham it or graham i and he doesn't seem to be given his real name and he just went through like in this youtube video with this, this sort of map of of southern occupied palestine or the israeli settlements around the gaza strip and he was saying well this happened and this happened and he's just saying in this sort of very south african manner of fact you know very white very sort of boa manner of, matter of fact way well you know hamas are trying to use human shields but the israeli military is just carrying on like as if there's no human shield, so they're not going to let them get away with that. So he's just effectively saying, yeah, they're just going to bomb everything, including the Israeli captives. And he very specifically said there was um, a case where, um, I, I go through it in the article, in, in that article from November, there was a case where um, he said, either the, either the Hamas terrorists or possibly Israeli airstrikes bombed this vehicle and killed everyone in the vehicle. Uh, including the Israeli captives. Um, and so that, to me, was a, a fairly early indication of this. But, you know, there's just been so many indications of it. And the significance of this Bergman article is that it is absolutely confirmed, but it's being it's being very aggressively ignored by um, the the Western media, by the Western mainstream Western media. Um, and as you say, like, except to deny that it's that it's happening or to downplay it right so as we wrap up here i am kind of taken aback but i never had a very positive i never had a remotely positive assessment of israel and its influence on u.s politics or just what it was attempting to do over there in general it always seems like a, an insane project and the power of it in the u.s seemed in in basically all our institutions, our liberal institutions, education, media, politics, um, they just are, they're unassailable. Mm. And um, where, as so I see them not really having any way to check what they do by and large in the US or apparently in Israel itself. But what's happening now, I think, is that they're running into the limits of what, how much that matters. So I don't, some people, it, it becomes a matter of ideology. People want to argue about who's really, oh, it's, this, they're really just doing what the U.S. wants. The U.S. wants this wider war. I don't really, I tend to think that's likely not true, but I yeah. confess to not being privy to these discussions. Do you, I, I agree guess with the, you. To, clo to close here, what do you, I, I think it's more like you can't, it's hard to conceptualize how insane Zionism is and powerful it is in the U.S. establishment over decades. It seems to have grown in, in, a, in, a, in ways that we don't totally understand. So I guess my two-part thing for you to, to wrap up here is how much of this do you think is coming from the U.S. being in favor of what's happening here? And then where do you see it going uh, based on that? Because I think the outcome is going to be a, a function of, in to a large degree of what the u.s really is hoping which they're not saying openly about this but i i am, am very curious to see what you would think about this yeah i mean i tend to agree with you actually Aaron, and, and i think this is a really big question for our time that i i don't know all the answers to but i mean i i, I tend to agree with that and i i think that um you know look there's this really big part of what the western left which is very big on 
sort of saying, well, the Israel lobby doesn't have any effect and that, you know, it's all, it's a, it's a puppet state for the United States and it, it does everything that the United States want. I, I don't agree with that. I, I don't think, I think that's really overplayed. And I think the, the dynamics are more complicated than that. Look, there's no doubt whatsoever that Joe Biden could make a phone call tonight and, and end the war on, on the Gaza Strip. There's no, there's no doubt about that, right? So America does have a great deal of influence and leverage over Israel if it chose to use it, but it, it doesn't choose to use it. And, you know, if the Israel lobby has no effect, then why do they put in multi-million dollars every year into the Israel lobby? Why is there... Why is then the need to buy off all these politicians in the United States? You know, le legal bribery of politicians by APAC, millions and millions of dollars every year. We know less about what they do in Britain because it, these um, the equivalent groups to APAC, Labour Friends of Israel, Conservative Friends of Israel, and so forth. They don't reveal their um, their funding at all. Uh, the, uh, my friends over at Declassified UK have just come out with some really good new reporting about this. Obviously, the Israel lobby is something I've written about in my book as well and reporting over the years. But I think that the Israel lobby does have a big effect because, you know, it's up to me. I think it's, uh, you know, ironically for, for leftists, it's a really unmaterial and materialistic uh, analysis to say exactly that that's why i think they can't no deal with it i don't it, think it, that they can deal with it, it even me like, as, as a leftist myself i didn't fully grasp the total insanity of it until recently i was always opposed to it and thought it was a nefarious influence but it wasn't until this where I, where it's like you you there's something here that goes crazy and beyond what what historical materialism is going to be able to point you to i, I think we're going to see I do think very we're very I mean it's hard, always hard to predict the future but I think um we're probably going to see more contradictions exposed within between Israel and America because there will be and there have always been elements of the American deep state which are not in favor of Zionism they they but then and even the British deep state especially because you know not some, you know, especially in the, decades ago when uh, Zionism was literally at actual war with the British Empire for a brief period. Um, so, you know, we are going to see contradictions exposed. I think there will there will probably be aspects to it that argue that Israel is a, le a net liability to uh, American imperialism. Um, I think we probably will see things like that increase in the future, because if you look objectively at the benefits of Israel to American imperialism, um, it's very questionable. I mean, look, our, obviously our role as leftists is not to help our American imperialism. Um, it's the opposite. But I mean, it is a, it's more of a it's more of a political and in in some cases, religious belief of supporting it um, because, you know, Obviously, in Republic, in many Republican instances, it is literally a religious belief of, uh, you know, end times eschatology uh, uh, and this kind of crazy Christian Zionism and, and whatnot. Um, but um, there's just there's 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 contradictions that can't be erased by just sort of saying, oh, well, you know, the Israel lobby does nothing. I mean, what about Jonathan Pollard? You know, Jonathan Pollard, uh, an Israeli spy who, you know, he was a traitor. Uh, he, he was he was an American um, uh, naval intelligence officer, very high level in naval intelligence officer who stole secrets from uh, top level secrets and sold them to Israel um, and uh, benefited materially from it. You know, that he later became this big Zionist and um, and he he served 30 years in jail. You know, there was, there was some elements of the American deep state that said he should have been hung for treason, you know, because he wasn't a whistleblower. This is the thing. He wasn't a, a Julian Assange, like leaking secrets. He was selling secrets to, to a state, which is ostensibly supposed to be this great ally. So I, 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 I don't, I don't buy all, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it, 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 look, the Israel, it, the Israel lobby has an effect. There's no, to me, there's no doubt about it. Um, at the same time, we shouldn't overplay that. Obviously, it doesn't 
it doesn't control everything. It doesn't have because otherwise, you know, America would be at war. It would have gone to war with Iran many years ago. So, so it it doesn't. It's not all powerful, but it has. They pushed effect. back against that. By the way, they pushed back in the '06 or '07, the time when Brzezinski appeared in front of Congress, and he said. We need to be careful. There's there's going to be a terror attack. It's going to be blamed on Iran, and it'll be used to start a war that'll be a big disaster. He did that in in 07, I believe, and that which is around the same the same time that uh, they put together uh, a team headed by deputy a new deputy director of national intelligence, who just happened to be my professor uh, for one class at Temple University, a guy named Richard Emmerman, and he ran the uh, national intelligence estimate on Iran's nuclear capabilities and said they're not, they don't have an active nuclear program. And those two, that they seem to diffuse this by doing two things. You had Brzezinski saying, essentially, there's going to be a false flag uh, that's going to draw us into war in Iran. I mean, it's a remarkable sp speech he gave to Congress. And then you had the CIA or the, it's the national, it's, now it's the Office of National Intelligence uh, in that case, I believe. But um, it was, they had a, someone put together an NIE, a national intelligence estimate that said Iran did not have a bomb. So there were people restraining them. And there seem to be some elements now that, that some decisions they've made. I mean, didn't they make the decision not to totally cut off all internet access the U.S. may have to, to Gaza? So, I mean, you wonder what things that are being done now to try to, to put a stop to this because, I mean, the, the war with Yemen would not seem good. A war with Iran does not seem good. The bases, the people in Syria and Iraq are very exposed. Right. And what political forces were behind making us want to stick people in Syria and Iraq permanently? The, every, it's you want to say it's oil but i don't know that that it doesn't logically make sense uh, the, what they've done if you just think of it in terms of oil yeah i mean israel has this and zionism has this massive amount of inertia you know it has this it's this kind of established thing which seems like i mean you know i'm reminded of the nelson mandela quote about it always seeming to be impossible and um, i can't remember the exact quote but always seems to be impossible until you do it basically um, and, uh, you know, the dismantlement of Zionism, uh, the collapse of Israel, uh, and the liberation of Palestinians in the face of, uh, the, the vast military might that we see seems impossible, but, you know, it can happen. Things can change very, very quickly, uh, in a very, very short amount of time. And I think, you know, a large part of the reason for all this um, atrocity propaganda we've seen about the 7th of October, about how it was supposedly this, you know, massacre of Israeli civilians by evil Palestinian terrorists. Um, a large part of the reason for that is to distract from the very simple fact of the huge military and intelligence defeat that was inflicted on Israel by a... Um, a, a guerrilla force of a, a relatively small guerrilla force of determined fighters um, and leaders who basically outsmarted the Israelis, you know, with much, much, you know, with far inferior um, amount of weaponry um, in terms of just the amount of um, hardware that it has. Um, but just by using smart methods like um, just a very cheap drone to bomb the surveillance technology on the Gaza fence, um, firing rockets to distract so that that was able to be done and then just sending fighters through the gaps in the fence to be able to attack the military bases as was done. You know, it, it, it's, um, it was really an unprecedented military victory for the Palestinians, which is, which has not ever happened on that scale. Um, ever so like that it that was a a military defeat which was deflicted on is inflicted on israel and which they um they won't soon forget and that they really had to um reverse the just try and reverse the deterrence effect but i think that is a genie that's never going back in the bottle like in the same way that um you know they tried to re after the defeat in South Lebanon, where they were driven out by Hezbollah, again, technically an inferior, you know, you, on paper, an inferior military force um, in terms of the hardware, it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have 
you know an air force it doesn't except for drones um uh it doesn't have you know this massive tank apparatus and so on and so forth um but this much smaller guerrilla force of determined fighters fighting on their own soil on their own homeland managed to defeat a much larger army which is supposedly supposedly invincible um you know that psychological effect um really it can't be undone and it, it, so that that is that's also the reason why they're inflicting this terrible civilian toll but you see the fighting that's happening on the ground in gaza now israel has achieved no military victories i mean when you say that it's it sounds incredible because they they what have all they've done is kill civilians like but they they've achieved no military goals like that all their what have what have been their goals of of invading the gaza strip they say destroying hamas rescuing civilians they claim res rescuing the so-called hostages they claim um and um uh, uh, you know and and uh, dismantling hamas's infrastructure they've done really none of that they've they've killed no They've killed no Hamas military leaders. Well, they've killed more hostages than they saved so far. Uh, they've if rescued you exclude the no, prisoner transfer. Exactly, they've rescued no hostages. Um, the only hostages that have been released have been released in prisoner exchange. Exactly, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, and um, they, you know, they haven't. They they killed one Hamas political leader in Lebanon in an in assassination in Beirut. And he was the guy negotiating the prisoner releases. Exactly, exactly. So you know, they they've um, as you said, they've been killing their own prisoners, not just on the seventh of October and immediately after, as we said, but continuously. They've been bombing everything in, all over the Gaza Strip indiscriminately. They've really extended the Hannibal Directive, and there was an Israeli, um, you know, there was a clip that was circulating on online this week of an Israeli a relative of an Israeli captive on his on Israeli TV saying they're doing the Hannibal directive on us they've extended it to the the Gaza Strip you know because they they're bombing everyone there which includes captives and many there's probably been dozens now of those captives that have been killed um in captivity by Israeli bombing and there was even the, the tunnels <laughs> where they said that the hostages are yeah, they're, they're gonna salt the it'll salt the earth. It'll be like Carthage. I mean, it really is a Hannibal kind of a Hannibal inspired wow, thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's Gaza that's the Linda Est. Yeah, yeah, Gaza de Linda Est. That does that does seem to be their attitude. Yeah, yeah. The infamous. Um, yeah, Car the, the infamous Carthaginian Carthage. peace, right? I mean, that that to me seems like what they've. When you're saying they're not achieving any military objectives. It seems, which I think is is true, it, but it may be that it's the wrong frame. In that, are they really hoping now that they could have that this could somehow be a final solution for Gaza? Except they can't. Really, I don't think that they can really continue with the full scale slaughter. Although we'll see if they if they are going to. But also, they have not been able to to move them out into Egypt or anywhere else. I mean, I don't know what they. I think that they maybe they sense also that american military power is waning and that they have a window for this kind of final solution but i don't think that they actually do have that window and that means no, I, I, I that's don't a think they bad do. situation for them you're right yeah I, d I don't think they do have that window because yeah you're right they may be saying that but um you know if if american the americans want look the americans have egypt as another so like to go back to the earlier point i think i don't think israel is a, is a is a simple sort of puppet state of the united states empire you i mean it, it's 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 a client state in a way but it has its own dynamics as well and it has there's there's they have contradictions between the two and it um it's it was i mean the way i think of it is is it's, it's an attack dog which is often kind of bites the hand of its owner so you know to in order to drive the Palestinians out into the Sinai Desert, um, they would have to. I mean, ultimately, they'd have to defeat the Egyptian army because if they were going to go just act, actually defy what the Americans want, which is to prop up uh, their client state, other client state in Egypt, um, 
they would they would have to go against their the 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 policy of the Egyptian government. And so, you know, if they could get away with that, they would, but they would have to defeat they'd have to go to war with the conventional Egyptian army. Um which the Americans would put a stop to, unless, as you said, like there was a collapse of um the American military uh you know empire in the region which you know we we do see some signs of and it could be happening but i, I don't see any immediate prospect of it completely collapsing in egypt in that way um it's hard to predict with these things but i mean I, they don't seem to be able to do it they haven't been able to defeat hamas like hamas it's a few a few thousand fighters in the palestinian resistance are still holding out like they're still putting they're putting out never mind military not just military actions they're still putting out videos like very professionally edited almost daily videos several times a week of um hits on military targets within the Gaza strip like there was just this week there was these really um impactful videos of um a sniper so, yeah soldier being sniped um you know the bulldozer like, being hit yeah, the bulldozer as well. The bulldozer being hit with a, a homemade uh, Yassin 105 rocket. Um, they both look very dead. So, you know, these these are very, you know, this they, they haven't been able to stop this. They haven't been able to stop. And every time they say that they've, defeat, they've defeated Hamas in an area that um, Hamas comes back, you know, so they haven't done what they said they are, are going to be able to do. But they may try and sort of project some sort of, image of victory for their own population but I, I don't think ultimately they're going to be able to um and i think that there is going to be a big political fallout when there is a ceasefire within israel and it will be interesting to see how that plays out and, and especially all this stuff about the hannibal doctrine will there be any repercussions uh within israeli society then i i don't know i don't know we'll we'll see because there is this narrative within israeli society of sort of sacrificing um you know because there's the whole thing of masada the myth of masada so you, the you know fortress the, right yeah so when israeli soldiers graduate they take them to masada where reputedly i mean from what i've read it's it's not actually a, a thought to be a true historical story but reputedly during uh one of the uh, jewish rebellions against the roman empire the last um jewish fighters in historical Palestine um, were rather than give up to the Roman Empire, the, the Jewish the Jewish zealots, as they were called, um, not only did they kill themselves, but they killed their entire families or their wives and children as well. This is a point Katie Halper made to me. It wasn't just themselves. It was their families. So, you know, that's thought not to be actually true historically. But the point is, that is a kind of myth that Israeli society is brought up on because when Israeli soldiers, which, you know, there is conscription in the Israeli, in Israeli society for men and women. What a lot of people don't know is that conscription is, is although it's technically compulsory, it, what a lot of people don't know is it's actually very easy to get out of and that avoidance is, is thought to be as high as uh, 40 to 50%. This, this is not very well covered, but, uh, I mean, obviously, it, during a wartime sort of scenario like now, um, I would imagine that, that would um, the avoidance would decrease. But anyway, the point is that when Israeli soldiers during their military um, training, compulsory, uh, technically compulsory military training, graduate from their military training, they take them collectively to Masada, in the uh, uh, which is near the Dead Sea. And the Masada Desert, and they bring them up with this slogan of Masada will never fall again. So the implication there, I, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. The kind of almost uh, subtext there is that, well, you know, ultimately, if it came to it, we'd have to, we should, you know, all sacrifice ourselves rather than the, the Jewish state falling. And of course, there's the Samson option, which is. I was about to say, it leads into the, the nuclear option. <laughs> Yeah, which is the idea that Israel projects of basically nuking everything rather than give up um, the Jewish supremacist state. So, you know... That's a sort of Damocles holding over this this whole thing. I mean, when we talk about uh, what the U.S. can do... Uh, well, I mean, well, since Israel is armed with nuclear weapons and has a 
you know, a fanatical political system and uh, political inertia, as you said, well, it could end up triggering the end of the world. If, uh, you know, someone makes a miscalculation or a wrong step or uh, the state of Israel and the, the people running it feel sufficiently threatened. Yeah. Right. That's what it's a heavy. It is a heavy, it's heavy. Thing. I don't have a solution. The, like, I don't know what to I, do. about that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And I, I even as U.S., I don't think that any of us understands the amount of leverage that they have, because you look at Walton Mearsheimer and their book, The Israel Lobby, or you look at documentaries that like have been done on the Israel Lobby in the U.K. and in the U.S., then, OK, that stuff is, is straightforward. I think that there is another layer to the power well, there's two other layers, which are generally not talked about. Number one, it's talked about sometimes, but not the, the scope of it, I don't think is understood. The amount of pressure that donors and the owners of media outlets and, and advertising revenues and so on, uh, the, the influence that the money has, the Zionist money has in the United States to, uh, I mean, you, university professors, like you, uh, you have uh, Finkelstein denied tenure. You have other people fired for being the Harvard, the president of Harvard, who wasn't even a pro-Palestinian person having yeah. to resign because of this. Uh, in the in journalism, you have Mehdi Hassan, who's a total imperial flack, and yet even he had to be fired. Yeah, I mean that. There's, so there's that aspect of it, which is a totalitarian and kind of scary thing in a in a supposedly liberal democracy. But yeah. the other part is. You know, you think of Johnny Rosselli blackmail, trying to blackmail the government when he was a mobster because he had been involved in those Kennedy assassination plots, right? And he had a little bit of success until he ultimately ends up chopped up in a barrel floating in Biscayne Bay. But the Isra Israel, I think, is so, uh, an entity that we outsourced a number of really dark, clandestine political activities to, things yeah. like the Epstein Network and so on and uh I, I think that these for for reasons because sometimes congress would investigate the the cia and, and america's democratic traditions make it difficult for it to be the clandestine operator that it has been since the end of world war ii you know at certain points there were scandals that ha occurred so i think they outsourced them to the saudis and especially the israelis i think that the israelis have been a, a key center of the some of the darkest things that the U.S. has been doing to, to covertly as part of the U uh, system that it runs and that people don't have a handle on it. And as scary yeah. as all that is, keep in mind also that this crazy ideology, which is blood and soil fascism, and the fact that they have nukes, it is a horrifying uh, political entity in our, in, our, in our world. And it's intertwined with the U.S. empire itself, which is basically western imperialism i mean the culmination of western imperialism up to this point and now it's all crumbling and these two projects of the u.s empire and uh it, it, zionism seem to be basically uh, disintegrating or at least in a real terrible state and it's hard to see how it's going to be reversed and i don't think yeah. anybody even has a handle on what this means and how you can possibly deal with it yeah yeah i agree with that the way i I've written about it in my book is um, weaponizing anti-Semitism is that the Israel lobby uh, or as, as you put it, I think in a, in a recent podcast of yours that I was listening to Aaron, I think you put it as the, the Zionist faction of the American deep state. And the, I would say the British deep state as well. Um, it's kind of like the spear tip of imperialism. They, they have it as, uh, a kind of vanguard of reaction. That's how I, I think about it, I suppose, in uh, like more classical leftist terms. Um, and it is this kind of useful tool, but at the same time, it's um, dangerous for them. It's kind of a double-edged sword, and it, it has all these dynamics which could, you know, accelerate the contradictions in a very frightening way in these ways that would be described but I, I think you're right about the um the really dark stuff that we don't know there's there's so much that i think we don't know and um you know if we i mean we're getting <laughs> we're getting into really dark territory when we're talking about the samson auction and uh, option and stuff like that and I'm talking about you know the potential end of the world with a nuclear war and stuff like that but you know these are not impossibilities um and um but there is so much that i think it, about um 
the Israel lobby and Zionism and the way it works in our countries that is hidden and it, it does it ha you know it, you they, can't talk about it because operation. because you're po you, you, who wants to be positing a quote unquote Jewish conspiracy it's like a, yeah. the, in a way it's the perfect cover cover for yeah. putting the darkest parts of the way that the regime actually operates in the hands of this entity or some of them yeah. some of the things that get outsourced to them because you don't even want to I did not I resisted wanting to comment on this or or think in these terms myself for even as I was focused very much on the American deep state the part of the empire that we yeah. can't really see that, that we but we see what it does if we step yeah. back and look and I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I think what we have to, this, this is all absolutely true what you're saying. And I think also what we have to remember as well is that there is a Zionism in a lot of ways. And this is something that the scholar Joseph uh, Massad has talked about, which is, which is that Zionism is not unique. I mean, yes, there are unique features to it, but in terms of if we think of it in the frame of Western settler colonialism, it's actually very similar to a lot of other cases. We've talked about South Africa already, but in especially in the Arab world, the comparison that's often made, as well as Vietnam, is um, in terms of war, you know, with the Americans and so forth, the imperial backing. But the comparison that's often made in the Arab world is mainly is actually Algeria, because that was, you know, there's differences, but um, that was a project of European settler colonialism, where there was not only, um, you know, imperialism in the sense of military and, and political and economic control, but actual um, colonists coming from the Europe, from France in that case, to colonize and to stay permanently in Algeria and to disenfranchise the, the indigenous people, the native people, the, the North African uh, Arabs who, um, you know, were uh, dispossessed. And and the the colonists in that case also had the, the, the so-called Pied Noir. They had they also had a narrative about how they were, you know, the real <laughs> they, you know, they were the real uh, original inhabitants. South African, the Boers had uh, and still have in South Africa have this narrative about how the black people are not actually indigenous and actually they came and immigrated and uh, and and that the the white people are just as uh, native as they are and so on and so forth so they have these equally um fantastical and mythological narratives as as the Zionists do have so there is um you know there's a lot of similarities you can make and and, and a lot of ways if you look at the history of Zionism it is a project of European uh, uh, settler colonialism because and even of uh christian zionism because a lot you know if you look at the british empire the starts of uh, zionism uh, uh, and the colonization of palestine a lot of it was fueled by um you know britain is a lot less um religious now especially compared to british politics to um republican american politics with the uh, the evangelical Christian uh, constituency, we doesn't have the political power in Britain now that it has in 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 the Republican circles in America. But in the age of imperialism, it if you look at people like Alpha Balfour, uh, Arthur Balfour, um, David Lloyd George, the the the, the liberal uh, prime minister, prime minister from the Liberal Party. Uh, great imperialist who um, really the, the Balfour Declaration. He was the prime minister at the time. Um, you know, they were all very. They were. They were. I mean, in today's terms, they would be Christian fundamentalists. But they. 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 You know, they were the operators of empire, and they were making decisions on colonizing Palestine based on religious texts, or based on oh well, you know, the Jews have to return to, to return to Israel before the end times, and all whatever you know rationalizations they had of it that really had an effect and and zionism for the longest time was not you know the vast majority of the world's jews until the holocaust were anti-zionist you know religious and secular alike you know it was a very unpopular um you know the first the, the first zionist congress for example had to be um moved out of i forget where it was going to be held but i think maybe germany but they they couldn't hold it there because the the rabbis were all opposed to it and it had to be moved to switzerland 
um you know and then that later changed because of um the imperialists saw it, saw it as a useful tool but then you know it's not as simple as we've discussed that is not a static thing and in these things there is these tensions and contradictions absolutely asa and stanley uh thank you so much for joining us can you tell people where they can find and support your work yeah Definitely. Um, uh, so I am a journalist with the Electronic Intifada, and um, most of my reporting that you've, uh, that, well, I think all of my reporting that we've discussed in this podcast has been published at the Electronic Intifada. So electronicintifada.net. Um, and I have a, a substack as well, asawinstanley.substack.com. And I repost all my articles to my Substack and my, you know, my podcast appearances and things like that. So I'm sure I'll repost that that this there as well. Um, and I, I do so I do um, some I do original articles on there as well. But um, yeah, people can sign up to that. There's free and paid options for people who want to support me. But uh, I think I, I, there is some things behind the paywall, but I try not to do that. But I've got a series about Gladio actually behind the paywall, which uh, which is pretty good. So oh, well, very good. I should check it out. Yeah, and have course. you on to talk about it when we? When we yeah. Do. Oh yeah, that that would be good. I'm sure we could. Uh, I'm sure, you could tell me a lot as well. It'd be interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us and uh, for all the work that you and everybody else at Electronic Intifada is doing uh, day to day. I think uh, you you've been one of the most important outlets, uh, putting publicizing what's really going on there and telling us what they don't want us to know. Uh, so it's, I, I salute you for that. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Bryce. Um, it's nice to meet you, Bryce. Uh, yeah. yeah. Good to meet you too. Yeah. Special thanks to Dana Chavaria for producing this episode. And thank you for tuning in. Visit fordidetrying.com and buy the prologue now on Amazon. Keep your eye out for Chapter 1, which should be dropping any day now. Please do subscribe to the American Exception podcast on Patreon for first access to all Devil's Chess Club episodes and for all new and past episodes of the American Exception podcast, including the Peter Dale Scott Oral History series. Check the show notes for links to Asa Wynn Stanley's work at Electronic Intifada and at his Substack. We'll also link to his new book, Weaponizing Anti-Semitism, How the Israel Lobby Brought Down Jeremy Corbyn. It seems like every week it gets crazier. It's hard to predict what they're going to do next. Will Biden step down before the election? Will they use lawfare to take Trump out of the race? Can Ukraine possibly avoid defeat before the U.S. election? Will the U.S. neocons and Israeli neocons get their wider war? Can the global majority, after centuries of Western impunity, finally hold imperial war criminals accountable? It feels like the end game on the devil's chessboard.